Hey, there is a check your understanding problem on page 655. I will use it as an example here. We're talking about caffeine usage here. And uh, Mr. Wilcox has 20 students in his statistics class. He randomly assigns them to treatment groups. And uh, they all get a 12-ounce cola. But... Uh, 10 of the students are assigned to a caffeinated cola, and 10 of the students are assigned to a non-caffeinated cola. So they measure their pulse rate before and after drinking their 12-ounce colas. Now, I have some numbers to share with you if you don't have your book handy on my calculator. So... Grab your calculator so you know how to carry out all of these processes, 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 something like that. All right, then go to uh, the stat and edit the list. So clear list one and two if you have to. All right, the first student who had caffeine in the caffeine group, they did not have a pulse rate of eight. I hope not. Uh, their pulse increased by eight. All right, so the change in their pulse when they had the caffeinated cola was positive eight, taking their measurement after drinking their cola, subtract before. All right, then it goes, so it goes eight, three for the next student, then five, one, four, zero, six, one, Four, zero. You could always replay if I went too fast there. All right, list two are these students assigned to the other treatment group. They got a, a non-caffeinated cola. However, they didn't know it was non-caffeinated. They are the placebo group. All right, so three, negative two. All right, their uh, pulse actually was less after drinking the cola than before by two beats per minute. Four, Negative one, five, five, one, two, negative one, and four. Uh, not great changes in uh, these numbers here, but definitely I see some negatives in uh, list two. No negatives in the uh, experimental group. So, okay, now let's see what happens here. Um, I can already conduct. A test actually we're, we're doing a confidence interval today all right so that is the purpose of the video to be able to uh, make a confidence interval for the difference in two means pot two population means okay we're not only interested in these 10 students but all students like these represented by these students so all students like these students is what we're interested in what would be the change in the pulse rate of thousands or millions of students like these who have caffeine or no caffeine. Uh, so let's go to the test menu though. Let's see here. Too many clicks there. Stat. Go to tests. Stat. Tests. But we're actually doing an interval. Interval is under the test menu too. Two samples. Two sample T interval, two sample T interval, that's the one I want. Okay, so uh, let's see, stats if we know the sample means and sample standard deviations. Data, uh, if we don't, we just have the data. So you're going to put uh, list one and list two for the two lists that we're using. Just leave frequency at one. We're going to do a 95% confidence level. And uh, we're going to calculate. All right, so here comes the calculation. There is our confidence interval. We are 95% confidence that the true, the true difference in the population means of change in pulse rate for students like these taking the uh, mean for the Caffeine group subtract the mean for the uh, placebo group is from negative 1.302 to 
positive 3.7017. Now, what do we know? We know that zero is in that interval. So if we were doing a significance test, we would not be able to reject zero as the true difference. So we do not have significant, we don't have sufficient evidence here. Uh, our difference in our sample means is not significant. Uh, we can't uh, come to the conclusion if we were doing a significance test to, to reject a null hypothesis that the difference is zero. Our confidence interval can tell us that, even though we're not doing a significance test, uh, because zero is a plausible difference. Well, one of the problems here is that we have only sampled 10 students, right, from each group. We're representing many, many, many students. Degrees of freedom is calculated here, uh, 17 uh, point, uh, point nine eight something, 17.99. It's not even a whole number, right? Well, degrees of freedom is n minus 1, n is the sample size. 10 minus 1 is 9. Now, if we didn't, if we were not given the degrees of freedom like we are in the calculator, which is calculated with a complex formula, um, we could, we wouldn't just add 10 and 10. That doesn't work, right? So actually a conservative approach, if you don't know the degrees of freedom, is just to say, well, I'm just going to use uh, degrees of freedom that is goes along with the smaller of our two sample sizes. They're both 10 and then subtract one. Uh, so if we were only doing one sample, our degrees of freedom would be nine and use that, right? Or if they're two different numbers, use the smaller one. That's most conservative. But since our calculator gives us this value for degrees of freedom, we'll, we'll end up using that. Okay, so there's our sample means. There's our sample standard deviations. So we already, we already have what we need, you know, to answer some questions. We already have the confidence interval, but you have to know how to write out the inference process in four steps. All right, so step one, we will construct a 95% confidence interval for mu with subscript CAF. That's for the caffeine group, those who got the, the real caffeinated cola. That's the mean change in pulse rate, mean change in pulse rate for students like these students when drinking 12 ounces of caffeinated cola. Well, we're comparing that to those who had the non-caffeinated cola. We'll call that, I'll call it the placebo mean. All right, so um, that is what we would like to know. What is the true, what is the difference in the true means? The means mean change in pulse rates. So conditions for a two sample t interval, you know, if we were sampling like out of a hat, sampling students out of a hat or out of a classroom, um, we would have to make sure they were randomly picked uh, from each for each group. We would have to make sure independence is satisfied. So we have to go with the ten percent rule. Can't sample more than ten percent of each population, but we're not doing that at all, actually. Mr. Wilcox only has 20 students, after all, and he's using all of them, but he's using this as an experiment. So the randomness and independence will be satisfied if it's an experiment because we're randomly assigning to a treatment group. And remember, experiments show causation. All right, can we show causation? Can we show that the caffeine causes an increase here. All right, well, let's see. The other condition, two of them are covered because of it's an experiment, but the other condition is normality. So, oh, I didn't write out why, but um, what we got to do is figure out if I were to take 10 students, measure their pulse rates, find the change, put a dot plot for the change, the mean change of 10 students and then so put a dot down then get 10 more students do this again and keep doing this keep making a dot plot what do we have an approximately normal curve so we've seen the effect of the central limit theorem we might have a population that's not normally distributed at all 
Maybe it's very skewed to the right, but if we sample two and take the average, and sample two and take the average, that'll make that tail come in. It won't be quite as skewed. If we sample five at a time, it'll look more like a normal curve. Ten at a time, it'll look more like a normal curve. If we do a sample size of 30 or more, the central limit theorem guarantees that the sample mean is approximately normal. But we need to make sure each sample mean is approximately normal, and then the difference in the two sample means would be approximately normal as well. All right, so if I can say uh, we, you know, because the central limit theorem guarantees it, because each sample size is 30 or more, I would, but we only have sample sizes of 10. So I'm going to have to set up my stat plots. We'll turn plots one and two on, make them box plots that would show me if there's any outliers, box plots, all right? Uh, using list one, plot two, we're using list two, make box plot, graph, okay, zoom stat, zoom nine works well here, zoom stat if needed, right? Um, so zoom stat will give you these nice graphs, and you know that the, the median is kind of right in the middle, it's just about as far to the right and left, pretty symmetrical. Yeah, there's a longer tail, but the middle of the box is centered pretty well. I do not see any outliers. I do not see any severe skewness uh, in either sample, which is representative of the population. So the population is probably not very skewed. Uh, and there's no evidence of outliers. So I think we're pretty safe to say the difference in the sample means is approximately normal for that reason. Okay, our calculation here. Okay. Um, we are making a 95% confidence interval. Our estimate is 3.2, the sample mean for the uh, caffeine group, minus two, the sample mean for the non-caffeine group. That's only a difference of 1.2, that's not very much. So the center of our interval is 1.2 right in the middle there. Um, this is on your AP sheet, uh, sampling for, uh, uh, two means, okay, from means from two populations. Got to do the sample standard deviation. That is why this value right here is a T, not a Z, because this value right here is an S, not a sigma. Not So we have to make uh, the adjustment and use T. All right, so on your calculator, if you want to get that value, uh, you're going to go to the distribution menu, and you're going to go to inverse T because you got to show your work. You got to construct the interval, show how it's made. Not sure why it didn't just give me the menu, but uh, let's try this again. So distribution inverse T usually just gives you a menu. There we go. 95% is the area in the middle degrees of freedom. Uh, about 18.0 is pretty close to because we're doing a 95% confidence interval. So put 95% there. If we're in the middle 95%, then we'll capture the true mean. If we're too far right or left, we won't. Okay, so there is your critical value right there. All right, so put the critical value in there. This is the margin of error, the standard error, and the critical value is how many standard errors you're going to extend your confidence interval to the right and to the left. And here is your difference in your sample means x bar uh, 2 minus x bar 1 or whichever way you're subtracting. All right, lastly, we are 95% confident. Uh, the conclusion would be we are 95% confident that the true difference in the uh, mean uh, change in pulse rate for the two groups is from negative 1.302 to 3.702. And again, zero is not contained. Uh, so if we were doing a significance interval, is there a difference in pulse rate or not? Two-tailed, that, uh, that would correlate 95% confidence interval correlates to a 5% alpha level uh, two-tailed test, uh, and our statistic would not be statistically significant.